Hello everyone, how you doing? Welcome to another video. So I've been doing this series of Tick80 uh, intros, 256 byte intros, and a couple of people asked me if I could do a video explaining how to get into Tick80 and how to do size uh, limited, uh, size coding stuff in particular. Um, I assume you're going to have some basic programming background, uh, but if you don't, that's fine as well. You can pick it up in um, a week or two, maybe maybe less than that, uh, if you're if you're uh, used to computers. So uh, let's just get into it, and I'm going to explain summarily what the Tick80 is, and then we're going to focus down on how to learn to code for the Tick80, how to learn size coding uh, stuff in particular. So let's jump right into it. So Tick80 is this uh, fantasy console that means that it's a console like a Mega Drive or Super Nintendo, but that it exists only virtually, like someone decided that they wanted to do uh, the restraints of one of those kind of consoles and uh, have them work just virtualized in the computer. Um, and then you can put it running on different devices, different operating systems, but it it all, all works virtually and it's all like made up constraints that the person decided to create. In this case, Nesbox was the creator of the Tick80. And uh, it follows the trend from the Pico 8, which was also a similar concept, uh, but it was not open source, and Tick80 distinguished itself for being open source. So if you go to the Tick80 uh, website, first you'll see like an example of the stuff that you can do already with the Tick80, which already shows like the, the potential that it has, and how it works as a platform for people who want to make like small games and things like that. If you go to Create, you can actually use... Um, the screen right here to test a few things it doesn't let you save what you made though so it's just like for a quick checking something uh, or just for show uh not really know uh, the exact usage for it but it's good that it's here so you see that you know it just works on the browser uh, you can uh go to the editor and you can run stuff directly here and you you see stuff directly running in in the browser so if you only want to mess around it's great to have it. If you want to actually start saving your stuff and build upon it, you'll need a local version. So if you scroll down on this page, you'll see like versions for the different operating systems. Uh, 090 is the stable version. If you click on the development version, uh, there are, you know, daily versions of that, which you can compile yourself. And then there's a pro version that if you pay like ten dollars, uh, you get some extras uh, stuff that uh, supports the author with uh, for creation of more stuff. Um, if you click on the development version, you'll see the entire um, open source uh, nature of the project. All the files are here. You can just download and compile this. Uh, all the issues are listed so people can discuss it, talk about what to implement next. Uh, someone, anyone can pick up an issue, make a fork, submit a pull request and try to get it uh, working. And you can see that it's a very active repository, 3k stars, 278 forks. So a lot of people, well, you can't see it because my uh, thing is in the way, but now you see it a bit better. Uh, 3k stars, 278 uh, forks. So you know, it, it's an active uh, repository and uh, it's cool. Anyways, moving on. Um, when you first download uh, Tick80, when you launch it for the first time, it will uh, create this directory called on a user's file, your username, app data, roaming, com, nestbox, tick, tick80. Which is very annoying, but it's where it stores all the stuff that it needs to store. I have it linked here for quick access because I would never remember this. Uh, and I ended up creating a binary fold here where I put actually the versions of the Tick80, the executable of Tick80 itself here. So I don't have like two different folders for different stuff for the Tick80. I have everything in a single place, which is a hot link it here. So when I run the latest version, which is version 1.0 development version, uh, you can see it here. And um, one thing that you need to know is uh, now you press F1 to go to the editor. You used to have to type actually editor. It doesn't work. Uh, also, one thing, if you want to have direct access to where the folder where your files are, you type folder and it opens up 
the directory immediately. That's a nice trick to have. If you don't know where your files are, just type folder. Uh, also, if you want to load something, you type surf and you can surf for the stuff that you want to select. I can, for example, pick my 128 byte intro. You can see it running. Uh, other stuff, press F1. And if you press F1, you can see the, the code on the editor. In this case, it's packed, so it's a bit hard to read. So let's go back to the default example that Tick80 had, uh, which was a bit easier to read, F1. And this is the default example that comes with, uh, I think this is the byte battle branch of uh, of Tick80. So this effect was coded by Super Rogue, I believe, as an example of what you can do uh, to size code your stuff. So there are two ways to size code on Tick80. Um, the first one is make sure everything is in a single line. And the second one is to rely on a packer. Um, there are different competitions where either of these skills are needed and they're not mutually exclusive, but they are a bit mutually exclusive. Um, so on one hand, you have to learn some tricks to do what is called cold goals, which is try to make everything into like the smallest way possible. And for that, you'll need to know a lot about the syntax and the tricks that you need to use. Now we'll cover that uh, in a while. The other one is that you can't like, for example, this is optimized for a single size for like the size here being 89. But if I do this, like this is a lot more readable for me which was what how normal coders would code it's a lot more readable for me but the size went from 80 something to 100 so uh it doesn't work for the fast category for the first category of uh size optimization but if you're gonna put through this code through a packer that will do the, the crunching down for you. It's much better for you, and it might even be better for the packer. I'm going to talk about specific things that you need to be aware of, uh, but let's go through parts. Um, first thing when you're learning about TIC80, uh, first you're going to need to know the programming language itself. Uh, TIC80 has several languages available. The most used one is Lua because it's slightly faster than the other ones. You can also code in JavaScript. I think you can also code in Lisp. I think there are a couple more uh, options. Never really looked into them. I just I took the opportunity to learn a bit Lua since everyone else was learning Lua, uh, was using Lua on the Tick80 specifically. So I stick with that. Um, if you're a seasoned uh, programmer, uh, all you need to know is right here on the Lua 5.4 reference manual. I have all the stuff here. If you're not a seasoned programmer and you're just starting to learn now how to program, uh, you might uh, actually want to get a book and actually read through the book and, you know, learn about programming the proper way instead of looking at references that you don't understand what, what they mean. So there's a suggestion even here, programming in Lua, but there are probably a lot more books about uh, learning Lua and how to code stuff for Lua. So, yeah, I'm going to... I'm going to circle back into Lua's specific things. Uh, for now, we're going to talk about um, the, um, the platform itself. I'm going to close this, which was running before. Um, I have a few links, which I'll post on the description, uh, which are useful to getting to know a bit more about the TIC80. Uh, one of them is this page that uh, layouts the, the RAM, which is one of the most important parts of any machine you want to know what each part of the memory is relating to, uh, especially in terms of hardware. Uh, even if this is a fantasy console, it still has that concept of specific memory in specific places that where it will be referencing to as it's running the loop and will call stuff from. So uh, if you go to this specific, specific page, you will see uh, where all the different things are mapped out, like the different tile, the video uh, that you see on the, your screen, the memory for that, uh, the different tiles and sprites that you have, um, 
information on your mouse states on your keyboards so you can access those directly as well uh, stuff for sound uh, for handling the sprites uh, even in terms of your video memory it tells you specifically what happens where is the pixels on your screen what is the palette that you're using uh, the border color all sorts of different things so this is handy to have if you want to you know get a bit down into the hardware level of the fantasy console you might not really need it for a lot of things but it's useful reference to have when you want to know specific uh, tricks that you might or might not be able to use um, another link that is very important or interesting to have is the size coding information about uh, coding for the TIC-80. It assumes that you already know how to program, but it explains you the basic parts like how to set up your TIC-80, how to get started, uh, even has some examples of different stuff. So this is, was very handy to you know at least read it once, uh, and then there's a few references that you can circle back to. Um, and you get a lot of interesting knowledge out of that. It's not mandatory though, you can still do stuff, but uh, it helps you get started. Like the noise function, for example, tells you some ways to get sound out of the um, TIC-80 without using the, the tracker part. We'll get to that, let me just go through the rest of the links. Uh, another part, another page that is interesting is the, a list of all the functions that exist in Lua. And this was made by another person, not Nesbox, so this is not like an up-to-date list. Uh, last update was nine months ago, and I know for a fact that there are a few more functions that are not listed here yet. Not sure if it will get updated or not, but I found this uh, list really, really useful. Um, it tells you all the single um, functions that exist. Uh, there are three main ones that are here. There's one new one that is not listed here. So uh, tick is the main loop that exists that will always run uh, at 60 frames per second. It's uh, capped a maximum 60 frames per second. But everything that is inside this tick function is what is being executed. Um, additionally, you have the, the scan line function, which will for each line that is on your screen, it will call uh, this function and uh, with the reference to the line. So you can do some things like change uh, something per line. Usually you want to change the color that you're using. Uh, so you have multiple colors instead of the 16 that you're limited to. And you can define the palette of the TIC-80 by code. So uh, you can change those kind of colors with with the uh, SCN. I call it scanline. I hope it's what it means, um, but uh, it should be. They reference scanline here on the comments. Um, then you have the OVR, which is the overlay function. There are actually two palettes inside uh, TIC80. Uh, .tick is the main one, and then once uh, tick is done, you have an overlay function that will draw stuff on the overlay screen so you have two buffers pretty much and they have a unique palette for the overlay which by default is black and i will show you that in a moment um then all of the stuff that's here it lists you all the other functions that exist how you can clear the screen how you can draw a circle how you can do a circle with a border only um, all sorts of stuff, uh, how to handle fonts. I learned a lot from checking this instead of, because there I couldn't find another more clear, direct way to have a listing of all the functions. So this is why it really helped me. And it has like all what parameters, what each parameter uh, is, which was quite useful. Uh, memcopy, which I also used to test a few things, like some feedback effects before as well. That was fun to use. Uh, peak for and peak uh, and uh, poke. Um, you can look at a certain uh, area in memory and write into it in groups of four bytes instead of just one, which can be really useful if you're trying to do some uh, specific stuff faster than going one by one. Uh, PIX is one of the main functions that you're gonna end up use. It just defines uh, what color is on specific X and Y uh, pixel. Like you define uh, the um, X dimension of the pixel, the Y dimension of the pixel, and what color it will have. 
uh, that's as straightforward as it gets. It also has an interesting feature, which is it returns that information as well. So if you do just pix x y, it will return you the color, which is good if you want to like check what color a uh, specific uh, pixel has right now and do something uh, accordingly to that. How to print stuff, uh, draw a rectangle, a rectangle with borders, uh, call a sound effect, uh, draw a sprite, uh, the time, how to get the time, uh, how to draw a triangle, uh, and a, a textured triangle as well, where you get the texture from the, the um, sprites uh, sheet, if I'm not mistaken. Never really used it, text try. Anyways, going back to our code. So this is the tick 80, as I mentioned before. Uh, you have the main tick. Uh, function here which will run all the time and you're trying to optimize it to be as fast as possible and put stuff on the screen so what it's doing right now is getting the time it's uh, dividing and a special kind of dividing by 32 this is flooring the time which means it will divide by 32 and get the lowest integer uh, on it and this is useful because if you want to do some operands on uh, on some stuff like they do later here to shift to three, um, it will not run if it's a float. It will only run if it's uh, an integer. And if you want to convert float to integer, you're wasting more bytes than if, if you would just floor it. And this is equivalent to actually typing math.floor and the number. So uh, time divided by 32. So this is what that slash slash does. It's calling this whole thing. So they save a few bytes by doing that. Um, then it's doing a loop for every single uh, pixel on the Y axis, which is 136 for the tick 80. Uh, and for every single on the X axis, it's gonna put a pixel. And the pixel is gonna be of this color x plus y, which makes it do a diagonal, and with time means that it's different every time. It has an animation, uh, but shift by three, and you have this effect. So yeah, so the palette that exists on uh, the tick 80. If you go to the sprite editor, you can see all the colors that exist here, uh, all 16 of them. It has the index, it appears here where it says sprite editor. So uh, you can see which one you are calling. And uh, yeah, if as I mentioned before, there's an overlay function as well. If you go to advanced mode, you can see here an overlay what uh, palette they have as well. By default, it's black, and the scan line by default as this color. It's called the it's called the Sweetie 16 uh, palette. Uh, there used to be another one, and there is a specific chunk of memory which you need to set to get this Sweetie 16 palette. Uh, if you create a new uh, cart for tick 80 by default like if you go to here type new uh, you will get the sweetie 16 by default but uh, there are some ways by code that you can do to not have this palette and use the old one instead and that will save you like one two bytes something like that um, so yeah that's that's some interesting uh, details um, other stuff that you want to do, we already talked about the reference of all the functions that you have, uh, the file format that it uses for the, the carts that it's saving, uh, that's important. And the rest is package stuff. I'm going to talk about the distinction between uh, code golfing and doing um, size coding with a packer. So what you see here uh, is limited to 89 bytes. You can see the size here. So, and this is cold golf to be as small as possible. There are some tricks to make it even smaller, but they try to optimize it to keep it short. Uh, what you would want it to be looking like would be something like this, which is more readable, you know, for normal people. So this is a lot more readable. Uh, but you see the size is also higher because you have all these white spaces. So it's 100 bytes now. So you, ju you just wait wasted uh, 11 bytes to have it readable. Um, so when you're doing stuff for cold golfing, uh, 
uh, you want it unreadable and extremely small. When you're doing size coding stuff, you want it to have him first readable and then try to optimize and doing what you want it to do and then try to optimize it to fit into a specific uh, byte, which you don't necessarily need to use the unreadable tricks that you're learning for the first uh, version, uh, but I will talk about them anyways. So there's this sheet sheet in particular that Super Rogue did, uh, which lists most of the tricks that, that you can save. So you can you can uh, save yourself seven bytes if instead of uh, typing function tick, uh, you use tick load and put everything into a single stream. That's one of the tricks that they use to make things really unreadable. Um, you can save two or three bytes to, uh, instead of using the T calling time, you just increment uh, T by by a little bit every single uh, cycle um you can uh, save six bytes if you uh, if you do like either a, a for loop that instead of going from 0 to 128 goes between minus 68 and uh, 68 um same thing but using uh, just one single uh, reference uh, one single variable um Instead of having Y and X, you can have just O here. And O does the accumulated uh, value of these two, which in the case of tick 80 is... Let me check real quick, so I don't say any mistakes. 240 by 136. So um, you can go through this and then you tell it to divide. And you see here the modulo, the modulo of 240 will always be, because this 0 to 3 to 64 is like all the pixels in a single string. And then you want to cut them by the end of the X. So uh, if you do a modulo, you'll have the remainder, which is everything else going long. And uh, you keep doing it like that. And to get the Y, you just divide it by uh, 240 instead of uh, doing the modulo instead which seems rather weird, but that's that's how it is. And the minus 120 and minus 68 is to focus it on the center of the screen instead of the uh, top left, uh, which is useful for if you're using mathematical stuff to do sinus and cosines, you will always end up on negative space, so you want it to have centered on the screen, or a lot of people prefer to have it centered on screen. Um, uh, other tricks that you can use is to alias some of the functions uh, is like if you do s equals math sign of, of a uh, you will have the sinus for this value of a all the time you can also do um, an alias for the function itself so you can still call it with a random value that you want to throw at it uh, you see like uh, good examples here same thing for for c if you're using math multiple times you can even alias the math itself like m equals math and then uh, do the s equals m dot sin uh, and that kind of stuff there's a nice little trick where you can uh, save some bytes instead of doing a square root you can uh, do an exponential of dot five which works in lua and it's really handy to to have um yeah, and aliasing uh, different functions, uh, that kind of stuff. So, going back here. So, aliasing is one way to make stuff uh, smaller. Like, if you're doing picks here and then you're doing another picks uh, here of some other stuff. Um, you can do a function that does these two instead. So if you do p equals pix, then you can use p here and p here again. And uh, it doesn't compensate much if you only use it like twice, but the more times you use it, the more bytes you will save by doing this trick. It also makes things more unreadable, but that's the trade-off. Usually what you're going to end up um, Aliasing more is the mathematical functions and there needs to be a little bit of a balance of what functions you want to use. For example, if you use a sine, you should try to use sine in everything, not use sine and cosine because cosine is just a variant of sine with a different uh, phase. Um, 
but uh, sometimes you have space for that sometimes you don't so it, it, it depends what you want to do what kind of effect you have in mind so yeah um I want to talk about the differences between the two uh, size coding uh, ways. One of them is this, um, cold golf, putting everything into a single uh, a single line, everything extremely compact, uh, reusing the same thing as maximum as possible um, to, to save some bytes and just get it down in, in total byte size. And if you're doing uh, a byte battle uh, competition, where you need to keep it be below 256 bytes this is very useful uh, if you are doing some size coding stuff for uh, a competition like 256 byte entry you can probably get away with not doing that much of that uh, size optimization because there are some packers that do some of these things for you um, and they try different variants of different things, um, which which can really come in handy. So I'm going to talk about two of them that I usually use. Uh, Exoticorn did the tick tool that allows you to to uh, process uh, different stuff. Um, I mostly use it to strip the the Lua of the um, of the um, of the dot tick file uh, because there's another packer which is slightly better but you can try both packers and see which one works better for you it has a few flags as well that you can uh, call to make sure that your tick file will have a specific uh, a new palette if it has the um, sweetie 16 or not uh, different kind of stuff that that uh, that you can try it it even has a heat map which you can see um, where it compressed better and where it compressed worse uh, a lot of different things that that uh, is uh, interesting to to have um, there's another one that I also use called uh, Pactic, which was uh, derived by an idea of using the tick 80s own uh, Packer or zip unzip uh, ability. So they have a, a zipper by default inside of a TK80. So try to make sure that they were using that ability to do the maximum so that your code is automatically compressed. So um, you can try some different variations. And instead of having the code, like uh, for example, well, I can load one of my one of my uh, intros, and you can see the code before it's packed and after it's packed. So, illusion is might be a good idea if this would be running properly. Okay, let me try restarting. Yes. Okay, so this is before getting packed, and you can see everything is pretty readable here. I didn't even uh, compress the math floors and math sins, uh, because the packer will do all that stuff for me. So I didn't need to alias most of the stuff. Um, and you can see that still uses a lot of things. So... Um, what is the difference between this and the cold golfing? Uh, for this, you can leave the code readable in that sense that even if you are reusing a function, you know that the more that you reuse the same function, it will pack a bit better. Uh, the first time that you use it, it's more expensive. The more you reuse it, it becomes cheaper to reuse. So like drawing false circles uh, gets cheaper than uh, just doing a new one. If I wanted to do like a rectangle, it will cost me like I don't know at least six bytes immediately. But if I draw if I draw two rectangles, it would only cost me eight bytes overall or something like that. I don't know the exact values. Just making them up to prove the point that the more you reuse a certain function, the the cheaper it gets. But you should try to avoid avoid using it at all if you can. Uh, so if you do everything in circles, it's definitely going to be cheaper than if you use circles and picks, for example, at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's one thing to keep in mind. It helps you keep readability, even if uh, sometimes this editor is a bit hard to read. There's a, another font that you can switch. This one is a slightly more readable. Kind of got used to the previous one though. Um, 
So this is what it looks like uh, before being getting compressed. And there are still some optimizations that you could do, usually in terms of um, pre-calculating stuff, trying to make sure that you reuse the same uh, values as much as possible. If you have like two digit numbers, try to make it down into one single digit by some way, or if you have three digit numbers, try to make it down into two digit numbers so it's smaller and reuse the same number. So using 014 here and using 014 here compresses a lot better with uh, with the other packer because it will look for similarities, for patterns and compress those uh, entirely with the single reference. Um, the comments will be automatically scraped the spaces will be automatically wiped as well so um like try to reduce the amount of variables that you're not using for anything like if you have a variable that is always has a number that you can calculate immediately and put the value there uh, do the math and put the actual number instead of having that variable to taking up uh, declaration space uh, things like here 25 26 i could have uh, something declaring a 25 and then do uh, that plus one uh, but it's easier for or it compresses better if you have the number directly here um, in most cases at least there are i'm sure there are some cases where it compresses better and you have to end up uh testing different things anyways i'm gonna show you the version that is already packed it says packed and if you check this is not the code i don't know why tick id is not running properly but sometimes it does that Okay, so see, this version is already packed. Uh, it's all a single line. It could still be compressed further, uh, doing some uh, doing some specific things, um, like putting everything into a single line using the tick load, uh, stuff like that. But overall, it's a lot more unreadable. Uh, but you see that um, a lot of the stuff did not get like aliased because the compressor handles it better than than if it was aliased and i tested this um with a few different things like um doing the alias manually and checking how much benefit it will get me after the packer and it wasn't much so it's better if you leave this uh pattern for the compressor to to handle uh, itself um but yeah it's a matter of testing uh different packers in different ways um the cool thing about uh tick tool and pack tick is that they have um uh, what's it called iterations uh, you can define this and test which one uh, does better. And Pactic also has a thing where it tests all the different uh, combinations possible. It can be thorough, uh, thorough and uh, explore all of them, or you can just do one pass and, and that's it. Usually when you try to do a few more passes, it compresses a bit better. I'm going to run uh, a script here to show you what it usually looks like. So I usually create, um, for example, packing my Zinian thing. So I have this that just calls a tick tool to extract the Lua file from it because I only need the code. I'm not using any assets from the tick uh, core itself. And uh, pack tick uh, keeps the original tick. So if I would use here, a tick on pack tick instead of lua it would still work but it would reuse some chunks of the original tick which i don't want to keep because i'm not using them for anything and then you can add a few uh, uh, command lines uh, to it that do different things and if you want to know which does what you can open the source of pack tick itself and it's listed right here 
uh, single pass minus S, so it doesn't uh, check for different versions, it's only this one. Pedantic is to make sure that it's uh, fully compliant files. I was having some issues because I was using the scanline function, and the scanline function had a time function in it, but so I tried to make the time the, the time variable globally, uh, the time variable global, but um, the the packer would optimize it away locally inside the tick uh, inside the tick uh, function and inside the SCN function so they wouldn't seem to be the same so I was forced to use the pedantic for that loses a bit of, of bytes but works in the end um, the minus C is to get the CT16 palette as well so you can see here minus C to use the CT16 pedantic to avoid that uh, bug uh, minus S for a single pass and minus T. I have no clue what minus T does anymore. Where's minus T? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No transform. So yeah, I was trying to debug uh, what was the issue that why the Xenium thing wasn't running um, properly once it was uh, done or not running at all. Uh... Oh, that was good. Oh yeah, it crashes the new version of uh, of um, of TK80. That's true, um, because it, it should have probably some extra checks that it didn't use to do before. And this intro in particular does some weird stuff to memory, like froze every memory to all the place, so it crashes. So I can show you this one running on this version of TK80. I can show you on another version of TK80. The older version should run on this one. So this one. So it does this, and if you check the code, it's all of this. And the main problem is that I use this function SCN, um, which was calling the time. Then eventually I removed the time from here, um, but it was that was one of the reasons why it wasn't packing very well. So um, uh, anyways, if I call. this script let's see how it looks like so here it just uh, it called um it extracted the the lua and then it tried to pack the lua it says here the original byte size the stripped version the minified and the finalized with all the extra chunks for the palette and this was just a single pass. So the first time that it tried, it succeeded. If I change the file here to not have the minus S. You will see it doing different kind of iterations, trying to find the best uh, possible option. And usually you get a few bytes gain of that, like three or four, depends on how your code is um, and how minified it already previously is. Um, but it takes longer. So for first test, I always do single pass. And then on the final one, if I'm right, just missing one or two bytes, I know that I can try to use this to try to squeeze that final byte out of it. Um, Anyways, that's my tool chain. That's what I wanted to, to show you. Like, uh, if I want to do 256 byte, this is how I do it. Like, uh, test the effect here. Try to keep it as readable as possible. Um, do some variables, but try to not have that many variables in them. And then just test on the packer if it's uh, doing well or not, if it's doing better or worse. Every time you do a significant change, either save a different version or uh, test one of the other version on the packer to see if it's actually evolving in a positive way to have lower bytes than it should. And uh, yeah. Uh, what else can I mention? Uh, there was a new function uh, besides SCN was for scanned lines um, and on version 1.0 there's a function called BDR which goes above and below the normal uh, screen. So we're talking about the borders in the corner. 
Um, and BDR also covers those uh, top pixels. I think it's five, six pixels that uh, SCN doesn't cover, um, which might be worth exploring as well. There's also an ellipse function. It's called Ellie, which you can use to draw ellipses. So there are a few changes on the new version of, uh, of uh, TIC80, which is interesting to uh, test out. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to talk about before I wrap up this video is how to generate sound. Um, the size coding wiki has uh, some examples, some basic examples, some basic explanations of how the sound works. Uh, usually you throw stuff at the sound registers and uh, try to figure out a formula that somehow makes sense. Um, I know there are some people who have done different things. Uh, so there are mostly three ways that I'm aware to make sound on the TIC80. One of them is to throw random functions, uh, sinus audio functions or noise functions, to the, um, to the sound register address. Uh, we can do that with the poke function. There's some examples on the on the size coding wiki, as I mentioned, and I tested around with that and tried to get you know different kind of patterns of some sort. Um, you need to be aware that if you're giving it a zero, it actually outbursts noise, which can be interesting. You can use that for some stuff uh, without having to use you know math dot random. Uh, to generate the noise itself you can just put a zero there it also can give you some interesting uh, bugs if you're uh, expecting to do like a, a square that it's on and off and suddenly you hear uh, noise and on instead of off um, um, so that's one way to to do sound throw stuff at the register memory and hope for the best hope that something makes sense um you can use it with you can do it with pokes as i mentioned the second way that i saw uh, some people do was using the sfx so i'm going back to this view to show you quickly what sfx is so if you go to sfx editor uh, by default uh, there's only a single a single note which is this single SFX that is created by default and you can play it at different notes. So if you call it by code, if you call like SFX and the number of the thing which is zero, it will actually beep. And uh, you can do some sequences of stuff with this. It can be a bit heavy because you're calling it every single frame. So you need to like only call it at a certain uh, point and only once um, but you can make some stuff with this you can also try to poke some changes into the values of uh, of this specific uh, sound effect so it has you know different uh, volumes and arpeggios and, and that kind of effects or uses a different wave even because by default it uses this um, square wave but you can make it use um, the the other wave. The wave is defined here, in case you're wondering. It uses number two by default. Oh, it actually uses the triangle by default. And uh, you can make a change. And SFX is actually a combination of uh, different uh, waves and volumes. So you can define multiple here. So you can have like a sound effect and not just a sound. Um, so you can change those things programmatically and then use that SFX to play the chords or melody or whatever you wanted to play. Um, what I saw other people doing was actually having like a synth of their own. So they code the synth code, uh, additive synthesis or whatever kind of synthesis. They generate all that thing and then they throw that uh, buffer of sound to the sound register and have that play instead so it's more intricate version of the just throwing random shifting bits uh, what we call it usually uh, bytecode music uh, usually just shifting uh, time around and having some modulos and byte shifting references there uh, to to break or create like a pattern of some sort um 
so yeah these are the three ways that you can do sound out of the tick 80 for size limited stuff if you're doing like a full demo you can actually use the tracker and do the whole thing in the tracker mode uh, and use that um, but if you're doing 256 bytes all the information from the tracker is gonna use a lot of space you might be able to get away with uh, using some of it but 256 bytes is not enough for you to have like a, a full information of tracker information so you always end up scraping all the information from the cart on the tick 80 to make sure that uh, you only have the code itself even sprites you're not you usually don't use uh, these sprites these would end up getting scraped the ones that come from default uh this little guy so yeah those are the things that you should be aware of can't think of anything else that i should add um I hope this was useful. I know I didn't do much code showing actual stuff, but you can go to lifecode.demozoo.org and check all the different uh, code effects that uh, different people did on the different uh, battles that existed, like for example, the Duck Jam. Uh, you can see all the source code of the different stuff here and study that, how that worked, which is a lot better than uh, the the sort of code that I could output here on the whim. All the battles are here. Download, 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 and you can check how each and every single one of these effects were created under 256 bytes. So yeah, I hope this video was useful. Sorry it was just a single take. Uh, might be a bit messy and it's 45 minutes long, so it's more of a seminar than a thing. Could have prepared it a bit better, but I hope it was uh, still useful. If you have any questions, feel free to post on the, on the comments below and I'll be happy to respond. I'll include all the links to all this stuff. And yeah, hope you are excited about creating stuff. Uh, we have a few compos of size limited competitions coming up at Inertia Demo Party, 30 and 31 of October. We will have a, a byte jam where people will just be coding on the tick 80 whatever they want. Uh, we will also have specific size limited competitions. Uh, the main announced one is 256 bytes, but if we have more than three entries for a specific um, competition combination we will also have those compos um i'm rallying some people to have a 512 byte tick 80 specific compo so that's gonna probably gonna happen 512 bytes um and yeah super so was also trying to get 128 byte uh, intro compo happening which might be combined with other platforms might be tk specific it depends on how many entries we have so yeah we'll love we would love to have your tick 80 size coding entries delivered at inertia just go to inertia.pt and uh, you have all the information there so i'm gonna list here so i don't forget to include it on the on the description so i put all of these links on the description if there's anything missing let me know feel free to ask whatever questions you want and see you next video bye bye everyone take care